Uh, all three give a version of the same story. This one is uh, more detailed, is the reason I want to uh, stay in Matthew with it. And uh, the only thing that is not here in Matthew, if you remember the last time we talked, Jesus was in the synagogue. He was teaching and confounding the uh, so-called wise teachers of the day <clears throat> and uh, healed a man there in the synagogue. The scripture says that he was uh, empowered, endued, possessed, <laughs> if you will, by an evil spirit. The layman's terminology, he was demon-possessed. And uh, they're right there in the church. Jesus had to stop what he was doing and heal a man from demon possession. And uh, Luke records that after they left the synagogue, they went to Peter's house. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I started looking at the text that, that was ahead and of course, doing a series gets me a, a, a heads up because I already know where I've got to go next week. I don't have to, to search that out. Uh, but I started looking at the text that as it comes up and Jesus goes over from the synagogue. They all end up at, at Peter's house. And I started looking. And you go through a series of things in, in looking at, at a text. You, you've got to basically interpret Okay, what is the meaning you, you pull out from the text, the, the meaning in it. But then you start looking at things that pop out at you, principles that are taught. Because let's face it, the history of the Scripture means nothing unless it applies to our everyday life. Every single thing that God said from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, you can find a, an application to our life today. And if you don't, you're missing something. Because salvation is great, that's what we uh, come to Christ for. Ultimate uh, redemption in heaven, eternity. That's what we look forward to. But in between accepting Christ and ending up in heaven, there's this whole thing we call life. And unless the Scripture applies and changes our way of thinking, changes our way of life, then it hasn't served its purpose. And I was looking at it, and I was thinking, this is way too easy. Because it doesn't take a theologian, it doesn't take a Bible student, it doesn't take a scholar to figure out that there are two very serious things that jump out <coughs> in the narrative that we're going to read this morning. And it's so simplistic. It's so basic. And yet, it will fundamentally change how we look at ourselves, uh, the things that we do, how we talk, and it'll change the world around us, our, our little worlds that we live in every single day. Matthew chapter 8, begin reading in verse number 14. And now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. And when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick. 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Father, we just pray that in the stillness of these moments that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. Father, just use me as your messenger to speak the message. Direct my mind, my thoughts. But Father, most of all, just prick the ears of the hearers. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Have you already figured it out? It really isn't hard. You see, Jesus didn't just perform miracles because he was a nice guy. Jesus was a compassionate, loving person that came to give us life, and as the scripture says, life more abundantly. Now, God is not some cosmic killjoy that sits above uh, the, the clouds looking over the banisters of heaven just waiting on us to mess up so he can smack us around. God is not uh, a vengeful person in that he, he wants to make our lives miserable. No, he wants our lives to be happy and blessed. We've got to work with him to make that happen. So Peter, he, he ends up showing up at Peter's house. They all go over to Peter's house and he sees Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. That doesn't really say, but uh, the scripture might suggest that uh, it was pretty serious. Medical doctors were extremely limited in the day and medicine was extremely limited in the day. We didn't we're talking about a time when we didn't have near the technology and the knowledge that we have right now. And so anything that they would get brought them nigh unto death. Now, Jesus isn't going to go to the home of one of his disciples, much less, remember who Peter is now, Peter is among what we call the inner circle of believers. You remember it was Peter, James, and John that Jesus included in almost everything that he did. Even when he would sneak away to rest, when he would sneak away to pray, when he just wanted to get away from everybody, Peter, James, and John were still there with him. They were the inner circle. They were the ones that he turned to. Uh, in a modern day church, we might say that that was the pastor looking to his deacons or the pastor looking to his elders or uh, the, the leadership of the church. They were, they were tight. They, they were close. And Jesus cared deeply. Now if he's going to perform a miracle for anybody, certainly it's going to be for one of his own, right? Right? I mean, he's already done it for strangers. It makes common sense that he's going to first take care of his own. And so the scripture says that he came over and he touched her and healed her from her infirmities. No big deal. Except that we need to understand the, part, the points of miracles. I said to you in the beginning... Jesus doesn't just perform miracles because he's a wonderful guy, because he's a compassionate person, because uh, he, he just uh, wants to be nice. There is, if you will, an ulterior motive. Jesus, when he displays a miracle, he is displaying his power. He's proven who he is. Without even having to say it. He is showing individuals His power. If you read the Gospel of John, and we'll spend a lot more time in it as we go on, if we stay with this series, as you look at it, John's Gospel is the miracle book. It records more of the miracles than any other Gospels. 
And it records a common theme. If you look at those miracles, different words, but almost the exact same meaning. Every miracle and his disciples believed on him. And the multitudes followed him. You see, the miracle was the means to get the message out to get people's attention. There are two little things I want you to understand real quick and real easy in this passage of Scripture. The first thing is that to you and I, and to a lost world, when the Lord Jesus Christ touches us and heals us from anything, service is just an automatic response. Folks, for a child of God, and, and I know this, this is not going to sound right because it doesn't. we don't see it with our own eyes. We don't want to admit it about the people that we care about and the people that we love. But you don't have to beg a dedicated child of God to come to church, do you? No. If you've got to beg them to come to church, there's something already wrong. You don't have to, to beg a child of God who is sold out, dedicated to the cause of Christ to share the gospel with lost people. And it doesn't have to be a, a walk through the Scripture even. One or two Scriptures to lead them to salvation along with your personal testimony. We'll, we'll get to that point here in a minute. <laughs> it's sufficient, but, but you, you don't have to to beg people to do that. When something good happens to you, what's the first thing you want to do? Tell, tell someone. Tell, tell, tell your family, tell your friends. What do, you do? what do most people, now some of you might not, but what do most people do when they buy a new car? Show it off. <laughs> exactly. Everybody I know that has, has bought a new car in the last year, that car is on Facebook. Because, I, I mean, we like to, to brag. We like to share good things that happen in our lives. It's just a natural response. And folks, you hear me. The Scripture says that He touched her and healed her from infirm her infirmities, but the message is the next phrase. What does He say? And she served them. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if I just got up off my sick bed, I'm not sure I want to go to the kitchen and start cooking a meal or getting drinks <coughs> or cleaning the house or whatever it is that she was doing of service to Jesus and His disciples. But the Scripture says that she served them. Why? Why? Sometimes we can learn a lot by what is not said in the Scripture. What's not said here? doesn't say that Jesus commanded her to, does it? doesn't say that Peter asked her to, does it? doesn't say that she was even required to. She just did it automatically. Because when Jesus Christ touches our life, it changes our whole outlook. It changes our motivation. It changes our desires. Uh, one of the best friends I had in Paducah, I've told you about him before, but Brother Hatcher uh, had a couple of just little catchphrases that if you had heard him preach 20 times, you had heard these catchphrases 20 times. And one of them is that when you get saved, you change. 
If you didn't change, you didn't get saved. What, does that put the burden on me to change? Is that the command that I have to change to be saved? No. It's the natural response to the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. When a lost person gets saved, you're going to know it. I'll never forget. It's etched in my memory. Those of y'all who have ever been in, in the Riceville Baptist Church kind of know the auditorium layout. There's a, a, a ramp that comes up to the side wall and, and when you walk in, you're actually in the pulpit area. The door's right off the side of the pulpit. And you can walk through. And if you walk straight in front of that pulpit, straight over to another door directly in front of it, you go down in the fellowship hall. And we were preparing for a revival. And uh, I don't know, we'd never done it before, but, but uh, we got the idea, somebody got the idea. In preparation for the revival, somebody was going to open up the church doors and keep them open all day, every day. And you got to come and go as you pleased, whether you had a key to the church or not, and pray in the church building for the revival. Okay, that's great. And uh, I've been over a couple of times, and there's people coming and going. But I was also at that point in time in college, and to help me get through college, not only was I, I working, but I was the custodian of the church. I, I cleaned the church. And I come in one day to clean. And I come through that side door, and I walk, gentleman in the, in the uh, altar, I slid past him. I thought, well, this might not be a good time to crank up the vacuum cleaner. And I walked down into the fellowship hall, and I got down into the fellowship hall, and chills just went all over me. And I was shaking, and that's before I shook for real. And it dawned on me who that man in that altar was. This was a man, his first name was Danny. And uh, he was, a, I guess you'd call him a, a distant relative. As little Jimmy Dickens said, a 19th cousin. <laughs> and Danny was forever in trouble. Danny was forever causing somebody else trouble. Danny was mean as a snake and sneaky as a cat and tough as nails. All us kids loved Danny because he would take us riding on his motorcycle and he would play with us. But folks feared Danny. And I walked through and I said, wait a minute. That was... And the pastor came out of the office and, and about that time, I looked at him and I said, is that, is, that, is that who I think? He said, you know, you know Danny? I said, I know him. I grew up with him. He's known him all my life. He's in the altar. I mean, I'm sweating by now. This is blowing my mind. He said, yeah, he got saved two nights ago. And I'm going to tell you something. Over the next few months, you didn't have to ask Danny about his relationship with Jesus Christ. It just started to show. It was immediate. Back in that day, we had what we called Thursday night visitation. And the folks who, who were willing to would, would come, we'd gather together to church and we'd pray and then we'd all go out and, and share the gospel with people we had already planned to go and see. He started showing up. And nobody invite him. <laughs> he started showing up. He should, because he got a better testimony than most all of us put together. You see, when God's hand touches us, everything changes. This woman got up, and the first thing on her mind 
was what can I do for you? Is that cool? Folks, when we get up from having a conversation with the Lord, when we get up from the Lord having touched our lives, when we get up from the Lord intervening in our situation, and the first thing on our mind is, Lord, what can I do for you? Isn't that what Paul said on the road to Damascus? When God struck him blind, and he saw the Lord, and the first thing out of his mouth was, what would you have me to do? Paul went on to become the greatest preacher that's ever lived outside of Jesus Christ himself. And his ministry has affected you and I sitting here all these years later. But there's something else I want you to look at. I want you to notice. And here's the good part. When God touches your life, when God touches us, when God starts working and moving in our lives, everybody else wants to get in on it. Everybody wants to be part of the good stuff. Everybody wants to be part of the fun. Everybody wants to be part and partaker of the blessing. After he healed her, she started serving him fine. They started bringing demon-possessed people to him. They started bringing the sick to him. And the Scripture says that he healed every one of them. I, you know why I think they mentioned the demons again? Because y'all hear me. Earlier, he had cast out one with the, with the evil spirit out of the man in the church. Now they bring up the fact that he's, he's casting out demons here in Peter's house. And healing the sick, and he puts the two together. You know why? Because, folks, some of us, and I'll put myself in, the, in that category as well, Oh, we may long for a physical healing for some infirmities that we're carrying around, but every single one of us need a spiritual touch a whole lot more than we need a physical healing. We need a spiritual intervention because I'm going to tell you something. When God touches our lives, everybody else wants to be a part of it. You want this church to grow? Let the world around you see the touch of God on your life. Let people see what God is doing in your life. You see, a lot of times we don't want... Here, here's the thing, because we, we have to walk it back to the problem. We have to walk it back to the misery. We have to walk it back to the pain. We have to walk it back to what is actually burdening us and troubling us and, and running us in the ground. And we don't like to do that part. I've told y'all some, some pretty wild stories of things I've been through. Things that God has done and seen. And it wasn't long ago, I can't remember how long ago it was now, I saw a post that Miss Linda put up that perfectly described it. Something to the effect that until your adversities, I can't remember the exact wording of the meme, but, but, but when you use your adversities to benefit others, that's when they have meaning. I don't tell y'all stories just because I enjoy telling stories, and I certainly don't tell you about bad things simply because I'm proud of them or because I enjoyed them when I went through them. <clears throat> but they ought to be able to help you a little bit somewhere along the way. And that's what happens. Look, your, your friends, your neighbors, the people that are closest to you, they already know all the dumb stuff you've done. You don't have to hide that. 
We do hide it, don't we? But there's no point trying to hide it because everybody already knows it. Most people do. The people closest to you especially, they've seen it, they've heard it. They know the struggles. They know the heartaches. They know the physical problems that you experience on a day-by-day -day basis. I've got some folks at work that are utterly amazed. And I am too. Because they see me in a much worse light than y'all do. Uh, they, they've snuck up on me when I didn't think they were around and saw me when I was just about the hair's breath from going to anaphylaxis. <laughs> and I'm grabbing for an inhaler and trying to get my breath. Dana thinks I'm going to die on the job. Bless her heart, she, she's worried to death. They see the struggle more than you see it. But they also see me throw a, a ladder on, a show, on one shoulder and tools in the other and walk around like I was 20 years old. How do I do it? I don't know. Don't ask me. Because I couldn't explain it. But it's utterly amazing. Folks, listen to me. If we would just allow ourselves to become vulnerable in front of other people, allow our humanity and our weaknesses and our failures to show. Oh, oh dear God, I'm not saying uh, flaunt your sin like that. That's a Facebook thing. That's you know. That's they they. Uh, we're we're not only uh, in, in sin now. We are proud of it, and we post pictures about it. You know. But I'm talking about letting people see the hard part of our humanness. Then they'll see and they'll understand the power of God in your life. If, if I were to turn on a camera in my house, which I'm not going to do, on Sunday mornings. And let you watch the hours leading up to me stepping into this pulpit. You would be absolutely shocked. I explain it, preacher. I can't. Other than the power of God. Folks, we just simply need to remove the, the walls we've built. We need to take down the protective hedges that we keep around ourselves and we need to let the world in and let them see because yeah, they'll see the bad stuff but they'll also see the power of God overcoming it. And that is the message of the gospel. And ladies and gentlemen, every time that Jesus performed a miracle, that was His purpose. Let's stand together. <clears throat> Miss Linda, would you dismiss us, please? Heavenly Father, we thank You again for the privilege of coming to worship You this morning. We thank You for the message that was given to us. Lord, we pray that you will help us to totally understand it and, and go out and spread your word, Lord, based on what we've heard today. Thank you for the one that gave the message, Lord. We thank you for Brother Gene and how he, he works with us. Though we're small, Lord, he gives us big messages. We pray for those who are not here today, Lord, that would like to be, and we pray you'll give them 
special touch and a special knowledge of your love. Go with us this day that everything we do and say will be pleasing to you. We ask, Lord, that you be with our military this week as we come upon the celebration of Memorial Day, remembering those, Lord, who, who gave their lives for our freedom. Be with us, Lord, as we go about the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.